Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Sarah Boston. Welcome to Co-Medicine. We have a great episode today. Uh, my guest is dentist, Dr. Jeffrey Gurian, but he is so much more than a dentist. In fact, he's retired now from dentistry. He was a cosmetic dentist and a lecturer at NYU. He is also a motivational speaker, a comedy writer, a stand-up comedian, a director, an author, a producer, a radio personality, a film writer. He's a host of Comedy Matters TV, and he is a non-traditionally trained psychotherapist. So that's a lot of things, and he really does all those things. And I kept thinking, what do these things have in common? And I think in a word, it's happiness. So he spreads happiness through the world through all of his different endeavors. He made me so happy coming on the show. He also knows, I think, every famous comedian that you can think of. Uh, he knows them. So I was pretty excited that I know him now, too. <laughs> So I hope you enjoy my chat. Uh, you will learn a lot. I promise you will learn a lot about comedy, but also just about life and, and happiness. Uh, so please enjoy this chat with Dr. Jeffrey Gurian. Welcome to Co-Medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Gurian. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm excited to be on with you. It's a great concept. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad I found you. So I always start uh, talking about the more clinical side, even though I don't even know there's so many layers to, <laughs> to your career and your clinical side. But we'll start with your origins as a dentist and a cosmetic dentist and a clinical professor at NYU. So tell me about why you became a dentist and how you got into dentistry and kind of your career as a dentist to start with. Well, I must have been a very strange kid because when I was 12 years old, I already decided what I wanted to be. I was a very sensitive child, and I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I also knew at, at that young age that I, I didn't think I could handle life and death situations. And I was wearing braces at the time, and I said, you know what, I'll be a dentist because then I can make people look beautiful, and I won't have to worry about anybody dying. The worst that can happen is the nerve in their tooth will die, but the person will still stay alive. And I was already writing comedy. And so it's interesting even to me that I decided at such a young age, at 12 years old, what I wanted to do. And my whole life has been that split between dentistry and comedy. I could never make up my mind which I like best, so I did both. And then after I was a cosmetic specialist, I did that for 25 years. And then I, uh, I taught at NYU in the oral medicine and oral facial pain department, also radiology. And my specialty, became taking away headaches just using the energy from my hand. Now, if you walk into a university and you tell them that you take headaches away with your hands, they'll probably call the police. But with me, they saw me doing it for 12 years, and the head of the oral medicine department called me to her office, Joan Phelan, a wonderful woman, and she said, I'd like you to lecture to the faculty on what you're doing because it's really interesting. I thought she was calling me there to fire me because I always think that. <laughs> but she said, we're underutilizing you. You should really be teaching that. And then the head of the TMJ department, a very famous dentist named Michael Gelb, his father, Harold Gelb, wrote the textbook on TMJ. And they had this huge TMJ practice in Manhattan. And I've always been fascinated by the effects of stress, how stress affects people. It comes out in many different ways, but mostly with what people think of migraine headaches. In this country alone, and it's an old figure, so there's probably more, there's at least 150 million people who suffer with what they think are migraine headaches that are really musculoskeletal headaches that are caused by clenching and grinding the teeth from stress. And that has become like a focus of mine. So I like to talk about that whenever I'm on because many people, and especially women, this is really important, wake up in the morning with pain in their neck and their shoulders. And if you wake up in the morning with pain in your neck and shoulders, the last person in the world you would ever tell would be your dentist, right? Why would you ever tell your dentist that your neck hurts? So unless dentists are using that as part of their medical history, it often goes undiagnosed. And most physicians don't know about that. They don't have a clue about those things. So that was my focus, was to bring out that information and I would treat it very simply using just energy from my hands and a soft night guard for the lower teeth. So Michael Gelb asked me to do a treatment on him. And after I did that, he said, I want you to lecture to my postgraduate students. So I got to lecture to the postgraduate students at NYU on that technique. And then I lectured years later to the doctors at uh, Temple University where I went to school at the request of the dean. 
when I was in my junior year of dental school, that's when I met Woody Allen. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, he was my comedic idol. And growing up, I don't know, there, there, there were only three people I ever wanted to meet. Woody Allen, Salvador Dali, and the Beach Boys. And I got to meet all of them. You met all of them? I met all of them. I spent an evening with Salvador Dali. It was one of the most amazing things. And I spent an evening with the Beach Boys. We went backstage. Woody Allen read my earliest material. And it's kind of a crazy story, but I'll tell you. I was a junior in dental school, and in the clinic, they would give us these little appointment cards to give to patients. On the rare occasions when I would come home to New York, Woody was starring in a, in a play at the time called Play It Again, Sam on Broadway with Tony Roberts. That was his favorite co-star. I had no money in those days. I was a poor student. So when I would come home, I would go to the theater and I would leave Woody a note on the back of my dental school card as if I knew him, as if we were friends. And I said, Woody, it's Jeffrey. I haven't seen you in a long time and I'm going to be coming to see the show. And I just kept leaving these cards there periodically. So finally, I saved up money for tickets, but I didn't have the courage to go alone. And I knew that if you want to meet a big star like Woody Allen, you have to impress them with your sanity because you could be a lunatic. He's not going to the theater hoping to meet me. So I said, well, there's only two ways to show you're sane. You either wear a tie or you bring a pretty girl with you. And I didn't have a tie and I only knew one pretty girl. <laughs> and she hated me because we had just broke up. But she knew my dream was to meet Woody Allen. So she agreed to come with me. And when I got to the theater that night, I left her my last card and I said, Woody, I'm here. I knew so little. I said, I'll be back during intermission. I didn't even know you wait till the end of the show. I go during intermission. So intermission comes and I'm so nervous and I'm going to chicken out. And she goes, you can't do this. I came with you. You have to go and do this. So I'm like, OK. So we go backstage. And in those days, there was no terrorism. There was hardly any security. The stage manager was not in his chair. And I said, oh, this is great. So I take her hand and I run up these stairs, but I, I, I wound up on the roof. So I come back down and he's there and he says, can I help you? And I said, yes, Woody is expecting me. And he said, well, go right in. Didn't question me at all, just go right in. So I go to Woody's dressing room and it's empty. He's in Tony Roberts' dressing room with the entire cast. And now I remember this like it was yesterday. I walk up to the door and Woody is sitting on a couch across the room. And I go like this to him. And he goes like this, me? And I'm like, yes, you. And he comes over and he's actually holding my card. And he says to me, you must be Jeff. And at that point, I lost it. I was so excited about meeting my idol. I started saying stupid things like, let's open up a day camp and throw winter clothes at people. <laughs> I said, let's walk low like we used to in Europe. And he looked at the girl I was with. He goes, this guy is an effing nut. Just like that. And I realized I was too intense. So I, I calmed myself down and I said, you know, I'm here because I write comedy and everybody says that my stuff is so much like yours. I mean, now I'm horrified to think that I had the nerve to do that. And he said to me, well, I'm in the middle of a show. Do you think you could come back tomorrow night? And I said, I'm, no, I'm sorry. I'm much too busy. No, I, you, I didn't do that. You didn't. I, said, <laughs> no. I begged the same girl to come back with me. And she did. And at the end of the show, he sat with me for about an hour in his dressing room and he read all of my material. And I was much more relaxed and I said something ridiculous again. I said, you know, the Aztecs weren't too good at tap dancing, but boy, could they sway. And I tried to convince him that swaying was going to be a very big thing. Anyway, he sat with me for an hour and he encouraged me. He said, your comedy is very visual and you should really think of making a film out of it which I did a few years later. I made these little crazy comedy films for the Toyota Comedy Festival. It was called the Men Who Series. It's on my YouTube channel, if anybody wants to see it, comedymatterstv.com. And it's very strange. It's men doing very unusual things, like men who take a pitchfork to the movies, uh, men who enjoy Latin dancing with tools. There's one film called Men Who Dance Where They're Not Supposed To. And the star of that film went on to become one of the biggest stars in the world. Peter Dinklage, the star of Game of Thrones, is dancing in my film. <laughs> he gets arrested for dancing in a no dancing zone. So that was my story with Woody Allen. 
Years later, his manager, Jack Rollins, became very helpful in my career, very influential in my career. And he said to me, it's so rare that Woody would have done something like that for you. He must have really seen something in you because it's not like him to do that. Both Jack Rollins and Charlie Jaffe were Woody's managers for many, many years until they passed away. All of Woody's movies, they always say, produced by Rollins and Jaffe. I wrote Jack Rollins a letter on my dental stationery. And I told him that I was a dentist who writes comedy. And I think I was writing for Rodney Dangerfield at the time and Joan Rivers and a bunch of people, the Friars Club. And he invited me down to his office to meet with him. And then he called Saturday Night Live and asked them to meet with me. And he, he arranged for a meeting with a man named Herb Sargent, who was a very, very famous comedy writer who left us in recent years. When I got to meet Herb, I said, did you read my material? He said, I did, but I didn't even have to. He said, if Jack Rollins says you're funny, you're funny. <laughs> and that was it. I could go on and on. I have a lot of stories. Oh, I know. It's amazing. Well, I checked out some of those videos and I, I think you, I know other people have said this, you're a bit ahead of your time because it must have been so much harder to make those videos at the time compared to what people can do now. They can just make one with their phone and throw it up on their YouTube or throw it up, you know, on Instagram or whatever. And you were, you were doing it with like a real camera and VHS, I think. With a Super 8 camera. <laughs> yes. It was in the early days of VHS. I was out on the street filming and I brought it up to Saturday Night Live. And that's how I got started in comedy. I, I snuck in. There's another crazy story. I was driving what could only be described as a pimp mobile in those days. I was driving an orange Cadillac Eldorado. Amazing. That had been made for one of the Isley brothers. And I bought it and I put a Rolls Royce grill on it, like the pimps drove in New York City, but mine had doctor's plates. I have pictures of the car still, you know, I should show it to you. And I drove up to 30 Rock with these films that I had on VHS. When you drove a car like that, everybody looked. It got a lot of attention. So I pulled up to 30 Rock and I threw the doorman a couple of bucks and I said, please watch my car. Lorne Michaels is expecting me. Lorne Michaels never heard of me, you know. I just, I had a lot of nerve in those days. I was in my 20s. Nothing was going to stand in my way. So I snuck in the elevator. These days, if you tried to do that, they'd shoot at you. But in those days, again, there was no terrorism. You could pull up right in front of 30 Rock. I went upstairs. They were all kids. Saturday Night Live was new in those days. So a fellow named Alan Zweibel, who went on to become an award-winning producer and director and writer, best friends with Gilda Radner. He was one of the top writers on Saturday Night Live at the time. And he was playing handball on the wall when I got out of the elevator with a, a guy named Neil Levy, Lorne Michaels' cousin. And I told him, I said, I introduced myself and I made these films and he looked at the films. He goes, I never saw anything like that. And he did the nicest thing. Well, I'll give you an example. It was like false crimes. Like several men were arrested for smearing cream cheese on the ankles of elderly women who wore their stockings rolled down like bagels. I don't know if you ever saw old women wear their stockings around their ankles. It looked like <laughs> bagels to me. So I got my dear grandmother to make believe that she had a Jewish accent. And, and she didn't have an accent, but she had a great sense of humor. And she said, you know, in the Jewish religion, we have two kinds of stockings, one for milk and one for meat. <laughs> and this crazy man, he smeared cream cheese on my meat stockings and I can't get it off. And I zoomed in with my camera on her ankles. So I bring this to Saturday Night Live. To this day, Alan Zweibel remembers this. Decades later, he says, I can't get that image out of my mind. So he called his manager for me, a man named David Jonas who at the time was managing Freddie Prinz, the original Freddie Prinz. He had gotten him the show Chico and the Man. And he spent about a year trying to talk me out of doing comedy. He said, you're a doctor. What do you need this for? But I was like, it's in me. I have to do this. So he got me started writing for his comedians, the ones that went on to do Catskills on Broadway. I don't know if you know that show. It was a very famous Broadway show called the Catskills on Broadway. And I got started writing for comedians like Dick Capri and Freddie Roman and Mousy Lawrence and all those guys. And it was because Alan Zweibel was so kind that he didn't just give me a phone number. He called him on my behalf and asked him to meet with me. 
And it took me about a year to learn how to write a joke because I was thinking cream cheese on the ankles. And you can't do that on stage. It doesn't, it, it doesn't translate in stand-up. It's very visual. Yeah. It took me about a year to learn how to write a joke. And then I started writing for all his guys. And that's when I met Rodney Dangerfield. And he started doing my stuff on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. What is it like writing a joke for yourself? I would call your videos are kind of absurdist humor. I think they're hilarious. Yes, absolutely. And now you're transitioning to like stand up, writing jokes, and then not just writing jokes, but writing jokes for other comedians. How do you describe that? Trying to write a joke for someone else? Are you trying to focus on their persona or are you just trying to write stuff that's funny? No, you have to write with their persona in mind. You have to get into their mind. Like Rodney used to let me tape his act. He never did that before, but I guess he saw something in me and he let me come to the club. We used to hang out together and he would let me tape his act so I could work from that and add jokes. When you're writing for somebody that famous like Joan Rivers, she knew her comedy so well that she knew what kind of joke she wanted. And so you have to write so you could hear that person saying those jokes. It can't just be funny to you. It has to be as if it was coming from them. You have to capture their style. And when you said absurd, that's exactly right, because one of my books is called Man Robs Bank with His Chin. <laughs> it's a book of all bizarre stories. I used to write for the Weekly World News, which was the precursor to The Onion. Okay. And it was a big honor to me. They said my stories were so bizarre that they had to give me my own column. So it was called Gurian's World of the Bizarre. In this book, it's got quotes from Richard Lewis from Curb Your Enthusiasm. He writes... These hilarious stories and the author's longtime reputation as a top comedian makes you wonder why he isn't selling out clubs in North Korea. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. And then Colin Jost, who's the head writer on Saturday Night Live, and, and he does news update. He wrote, ever since I met Jeffrey Gurian, good things started happening to me. Coincidence? Yes. <laughs> and then Nick Kroll wrote, Jeffrey Gurian asked me to write a blurb for his book, and this is it. Nice. So comedians are kind of crazy, but I always try and get well-known comedian friends of mine to write a blurb. But that's my favorite kind of humor because it doesn't offend anybody. It's just silly. Oh, I love that. Yeah. These days, people are so quick to be offended by something. You know, it's, it's just really terrible. So I've always loved silly humor, just absurdity. Monty Python. I shot a, a film in my dental office called Men Who Walk Low for a Living and Enjoy It before the Pythons did Ministry of Silly Walks. And I tried to show it to their manager. I wasn't able to get her. Uh, Nancy Lewis was her name. It's funny how I remember all these things from so, such a long time ago. I might not even remember what I did this morning, but I remember these things because they're so important to me. They really stuck out for me, you know? Yeah. You're kind of known for knowing all the famous comedians. How do you get to know them? You seem a little cheeky that you just will, you'll talk to anyone. You'll talk to Woody Allen. You'll talk to Lauren Michaels. How do you find that confidence and how do you meet all these famous comedians? It has to do with me curing myself of stuttering. I started stuttering when I was about six or seven years old. And I stuttered through my 20s and beyond, even into my 30s. After I graduated from dental school, I was still blocking on certain letters, like hard Ds were very hard. I could never say Gurian. I could never say my name. And I was determined to cure myself. They sent me to speech therapy, but no one was able to help me. And so I was stuttering very badly. I went to college and I made myself run for the president of the freshman class. And it was a very big college. It was fed into by seven different high schools. And I only knew kids from my high school. I didn't know any of the other kids. Thousands of kids were there. And I couldn't say my name, so I couldn't introduce myself to people. But I told myself if I could win the election, that I wouldn't have to stutter anymore. Because I, I had a feeling that it had something to do with how I felt about myself. I was only 16 when I went to college. So I was very young. I looked very young. I was much younger than everybody else. And even though in high school I was supposedly popular, I didn't really feel it. Like when I went to school, they still voted on things like, the prettiest girl and the handsomest guy and the best athlete. They voted me most talented in the yearbook because I played the piano and the drum. But I still didn't feel good about myself. So 
I had other kids introduce me to kids I didn't know because they'd say, this is Jeffrey Gurian, he's running for president. And then once I started speaking, I could get words out. So it was a great lesson for me. I won the election. I was the president of the whole freshman class of Hunter College, and I still stuttered. And the reason I say it was a great lesson was because it taught me that outside validation doesn't work. It doesn't matter how many people tell you you're fantastic and wonderful. It matters what you think of yourself. And that started my journey to take my mind apart and see what it was that was making me stutter. I realized one day that I didn't stutter when I was alone. I could be in a room by myself and speak much better, which is true for many people who stutter. And so I, I consider it grace. I was given the grace to figure out you can't have a disability based on your location. If a man has a limp, he limps in every room of his house. He can't go to a room alone and close the door and walk perfectly. But if I could speak fine when I'm alone, then theoretically it means there's nothing wrong with me. And so as you can see, I no longer stutter. As a matter of fact, you can't even shut me up. I talk so much. I love it. It gave me great confidence. In order to be able to speak to people the way everyone else in the world does without stuttering, I had to build up a tremendous amount of confidence. Not to feel better than other people, but just to feel even. Yeah. So now as an avocation, I work with stutterers all over the world, and I teach them how not to stutter. It gives me great joy because nobody's telling people that they can get better. You have eight books. I think five are on comedy and three are on happiness. So the, the more recent ones are more your happiness series. So let's hear about the happiness books first. Okay, I'll show them to you. The first book is called Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, A Spiritual and Humorous Approach to Achieving Happiness. The reason I wrote this book, Healing Your Heart, it's not about heart disease although my positive thinking helped me to overcome a heart attack. In about 2015, I had a very serious, what they call a widow-maker heart attack, came out of nowhere. I had never been sick a day in my life. And I was back on stage five days later, and the owner of the comedy club said to me, what are you crazy? You just had a heart attack. And I was like, yeah, but it's hard to get a spot here. I don't want to lose my spot. <laughs> and he said, only a comedian would think that way. But I wrote this book because from the time we're children, every time someone hurts your feelings or breaks a promise to you or insults you or hurts you in some way, it stays lodged inside of us. And I call them heart wounds. They're wounds to your heart chakra. And they affect your self-esteem and they affect your self-confidence. And they affect every decision that you make in your life. Because every time you're called upon to make a decision in your life, you think about what to do. You use your thoughts. But if some of your thoughts are not valid, they're not true, your decisions are not going to work out for you. And it's very hard to examine your thoughts objectively, but it's very important to do that. And that led to my second book, which is called Fight the Fear, Overcoming Obstacles That Stand in Your Way. Because I had to overcome fear in order to be a doctor, in order to open a practice, in order to become a father, to get married. Everything made me so nervous. And I had to process it. I had to learn how to control my thoughts. And that fear is a bully, and it doesn't want you to achieve your goals. Fear wants you to stay in bed with the covers over your head. And it gives you excuses why you're not enough. You'll never be enough. You can't achieve the things that you want to achieve. And it's a lie. But so many of us live with that for a long time. It took me a long time to get the courage to go on stage. Because if you start performing in your 20s and nobody knows you, you have the freedom to bomb. Nobody cares. They never heard of you. You're a kid. But by the time I wanted to start performing, I had already written for a lot of big stars because as a dentist, I didn't want to look like a novelty, like on The Ed Sullivan Show. He's got a knife throwing act. He spins plates. He's a dentist. I didn't even tell people I was a dentist. Joan Rivers found out from her assistant see seeing something about me on television. And when she asked me why I didn't tell her, I said, because no one hires you in show business because you're a dentist. They hire you in spite of the fact. It's not exactly a prerequisite. In 1999, I started cutting out articles. And when COVID came out in March of 2020, I came down with COVID double pneumonia immediately because, as you can tell, I'm a trendsetter. I went right out and got it. And I wound up in the hospital. I joke about it now, but it was a nightmare. It took me months to recover. And while I was home, 
recovering, I said, what can I do to turn a negative into a positive? I said, I'm going to write another book while I'm in the house recovering. And so I wrote my third happiness book, which is called Facing Adversity, Stories of Courage and Inspiration. It's my goal is always to put out positive energy to the universe, to inspire people, to do better than they think they can do. And so that's what my books are about. And I call them the happiness series. What do you want to focus on now, do you think? I think you like being dichotomous, maybe because you are no longer practicing dentistry, but you're doing your psychotherapy and, and helping people that stutter, but you're now performing comedy and you have Comedy Matters TV and you're writing books. Are you happy doing all those things at the same time? Or, or do you want to do you want to drive your focus into a particular area? It's the only thing I know, Sarah. I, <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else. I have a TV pilot that's being edited. I got hired as an executive producer and the host of the show. And it's called The Raw Side of Comedy. And it's a competition slash reality show. And we shot most of it at one of the main comedy clubs in Manhattan called the Gotham Comedy Club which is a 300-seat club. It's where I made my national TV debut with John Lovitz from Saturday Night Live. The owner, Chris Mazzilli, came on board. He joined my team to produce the show. So it's in the process of being edited. I just uh, got back about 10 days ago from performing at the Sunshine Comedy Festival in Florida. The official interviewer, I did about four shows while I was there. And I did a book signing for a book I did with Chris Rock. About a month before that, I was at the Vermont Comedy Festival and I brought Colin Quinn with me and he was the main headliner. And it was so fun because we've been friends for decades. So I got to open for him at this 400 seat theater and it was really very exciting. And then we drove back to New York together. And so I'm active. I'm, I'm always doing something, you know, always looking for new projects. I'm everywhere. <laughs> when I go on the radio, they play Jump Around. That's my theme song. I jump around. I go from comedy club to comedy club. Last week, my friend Mark Norman, who's becoming a huge star, he, he used to open for Amy Schumer, and that's how he got well known. And I was with him at uh, the Beacon Theater in New York, which is a very prestigious theater, 2,500 people. And he did two sold out shows, and I was with him backstage. I'll talk for a minute about my dental school experiences. I would love to hear about that. Well, I went to Temple University and they were very strict in those days. And I have this picture of me from my yearbook. The style in those days was to grow a mustache and sideburns. But my hair was nothing like it is now. My hair was very short. My hair was very short. I was banned from school. They thought that I was a radical. They banned me from school for three weeks. Now in dental school, if you miss even a couple of days, you're in trouble. You have a certain amount of credits to fulfill. So being banned for three weeks was a nightmare. And they were telling my parents to tell me to cut my hair. Now my hair was very short. And my father said, he's gonna be a doctor. I can't tell him what to do. They wouldn't even let me work on my own father. My father came down. They wouldn't let me in the clinic. And there were two doctors in particular that took pride in treating me like it was a four-year fraternity hazing. I expected that when I went to dental school, it would be great. They would welcome me into the profession. They would mentor me. But instead, it literally turned out into a four-year fraternity hazing. So my mother bought me a wig, a flat wig with a part, and they were so dumb, they didn't even know it was a wig. And this guy had me come to his office, and I had to turn in a circle so he could look at me from every angle. And he finally said to me, okay, you could come back in the clinic now. They had no idea it was a wig because a couple of weeks later, he was complaining that my hair was growing again. It was a wig, obviously, it can't grow. So they were just picking on me. Until the day they gave me my diploma, they picked on me. So I never had anything to do with the school. About three years ago, I got an email from the school that the dean would like to meet me for lunch. So I'm like, what's that about? Why would the dean want to meet with me? I never had anything to do with him in decades. It's not the same dean. It was a new dean. He's only been there for about 10 years. And because I told you that I believe in confronting uncomfortability, I said, you know what? This is an opportunity for me to tell him how they damaged me psychologically. They tried to take away my self-esteem and self-confidence. In order to be a good doctor, you have to have a lot of confidence. Yeah, absolutely. And they tried to tear me down. They told me that I was a disgrace to the profession. 
I'll never forget, one of my advisors took me out in the hall. He said, you should really think of dropping out of school. You're a disgrace to the profession. Because I had a mustache. Can you believe it? That's what made me a disgrace. I graduated at the top half of my class. I graduated number 54 out of 126. I agreed to meet with this dean, and he brought another dean with him. And they took me out to lunch in this beautiful restaurant. And I brought all the stuff I wanted to show him, my before and after pictures of my cosmetic work. And I brought a screenplay that I wrote about my experience. And I said to myself, I'm going to tell him my story. And as soon as I started, he interrupted me. And he said, I want you to know they were racist and anti-Semites. We changed the whole atmosphere of the school. We would never allow anybody to treat anybody that way. He said he had known, he read about me online. In his words, he said, you're one of the most accomplished graduates that we've ever had. And I wanted to meet you to tell you that we're sorry for the way that you were treated. And at the end of that lunch, he said to me, can I give you a hug? And I said, absolutely, yeah. And I have a picture of me with these two deans. And so he went on to hire me to do a series of lectures to the doctors at Temple University on changing frustration to enjoyable and hate to love, and also on dentistry. And he said to me, could you ever believe that you'd be friends with the dean of the school that treated you like that? I said, in a million years, I could never believe it. And then he hired me to do a comedy show for the faculty for the holidays, me and one other dentist who was in comedy. It's an amazing story to me. I had a pierced nose in vet school, and that was very radical at the time. I taught at NYU. There were guys with neck tattoos now. Yeah. <laughs> I think they were in gangs. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> if anybody ever saw them, guys with a ponytail and you know, I was, there, I was at NYU for 12 years, so I saw a lot. And it just used to make me laugh because these people tortured me. I mean, my hair was really short. Yeah, now let's talk about your hair, Jeffrey. I want to talk about your hair. Because <laughs> I've watched you. I watched some uh, stuff online of you through the years, and it was short as a, dent a dental student. But now you have a hair that's very distinctive, and you actually have a whole look that is very distinctive. And as much as you're comfortable, I would love to talk about that because I know people know who you are. I would recognize you anywhere. No one ever says they think they saw me. If yeah. you saw me, if they, think, if they think you saw me, you definitely saw me. Absolutely. I used to do that on stage like that. A thing that never happens to me. Sometimes people stop you in the street and they tell you they think they saw you somewhere, but they never remember where. But with me, that doesn't happen. Because if you think you saw me, you saw me. That's it. It's, it's funny to me because most men wear their hair like they're embarrassed for having any, almost like an apology. Like, I'm sorry I have hair and I'll try and wear it in a way that you don't notice. But to me, you know, when you go into the army, the first thing they do is they shave your head because that's your identity. Your hair is connected to your identity. It takes away everything. So they want everybody to be the same. And in spirituality, that works because you want to be a worker among workers. You want to feel part of. You don't want to blow yourself up. You know, humility is very important. But when it comes to style, I think it's important to be who you are. People would always think I was in the music business. The New York Post did a big thing about me on page six, rockers on Broadway. So I'm, I'm friends with a lot of the people who were in the Broadway shows, and I get invited to this. It's a charity every year, rockers on Broadway. Three different women came over to me to thank me for my contributions in the music business. It was so noisy. I didn't even ask them who they thought I was. I just said, thank you. It's just become part of my brand. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I, I think it, sh yeah, it shows all your confidence. It shows who you are. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. I, mean, I always wear a sport jacket. I think people should dress. Most, most comics look like they're trying to be homeless. It's horrible. They, they go on stage. That, that doesn't show any respect for yourself or for your audience. Jerry Seinfeld would often wear a suit. I use him as an example because he works clean. I don't always work clean. I know Jerry before he was famous, when he just started out, he always carried himself well. And he's a great wordsmith. He's just a genius when it comes to comedy. And he spent the first four years of his career at the comic strip. So he's in my book, Billy Crystal, Ray Romano, uh, Jim Gaffigan. Every big star that came out of that club is in my book, Make Him Laugh. And that book took four years to do. It took three years to do all the interviews. And it took a year to edit because it was a lot. I did every single thing myself. I transcribed every word myself. I wouldn't trust anybody else to do it because it's comedy gold. 
sitting with all those comedians, every one of them, George Wallace and Paul Provenza and every one of them, they sat with me and I recorded the interview. Gilbert Gottfried, you know, dear friend who we lost this past year, Bob Saget, we lost a lot of comics this year, Richard Belzer. I got to work with all those guys and I got to work with the guys from the golden age of comedy. I was a regular on Sirius XM for two years on the Bennington show with Ron Bennington. It's the top comedy show on Sirius XM. And Ron said that I'm the only person he knows who knew the greats of the golden age and all the young comics from today that I span the generation. And I can't even tell you how that happened. But I got to work with Jerry Lewis. And if you remember Milton Berle. Yeah. Milton Berle was my sponsor in the Friars Club. And I used to be on the phone with him and I couldn't believe that I was on the phone with Milton Berle. I was a little kid. I'd watch him on TV, Texaco Star Theater. We had a great time and I wrote jokes for him. And I got to meet all those guys, Henny Youngman and Sid Caesar, Jan Murray, all the guys from the golden age of comedy. From your book and also just, you know, a lot of famous comedians or from interviewing all those famous comedians, like, is there for other comedians that might be listening or maybe just for me, is there like a thread that's in common or advice for people that are trying to break into comedy that something you can take from all the comedians you've talked to that would be sort of like a common thread? If you want to do comedy, you have to go to open mics. You have to do, you have to start from the beginning. There's no secret. There's no trick. And these days there's so many thousands. Everybody thinks they're funny. Every state, every city has comedy clubs. And there's no shortage of people who think they're funny. The way you find out is if the audience laughs. No one laughs to be polite. It's a very quick way to find out if you're funny or not. It's a real art form unto itself. I look at comedy as something that brings everyone together. When it's done well, I agree. I agree with that. The world is definitely too divided right now. And we need comedy. I, I know I found a quote that you said that it's a bit addictive, that it you know, it kind of is something that, you know, you, you could have just been a cosmetic dentist and I think had a very successful career doing that, but you were always, always drawn to comedy and it kind of, it, it's something that you feel a bit addicted to. I don't know if you can talk about that a little bit. Well, it's a drug, basically. You can only suppress it for so long. If you have the need to do comedy and you don't do it, it'll eat away at you. You have to find out. It's one of the things, like when I talk about confronting fear. So I had written for so many people I was what you would call an industry name. People in the industry had heard of me, but the public didn't know who I was. But I was nervous to go up on stage because it's like Chris Rock's little brother, Jordan Rock, is a good friend of mine. I admire him so much. How do you go on stage when you're Chris Rock's brother? You know, there's so much pressure. So for me, I felt the same way. There was a lot of pressure for me to be funny. And then I thought to myself, I do this thing with my mind. I always talk about how to control my mind, which is how I stop stuttering. So I said, well, look, if you think you're funny, you have to find out. You can't go through your whole life and never know. And if, if all these other guys can go up and do comedy, then so can you. It's reverse egotism to think that you can't do something that so many other people do. It's like the nerve of you to think that you can't do comedy when so many other people do it. If you wanted to be the president or the pope where there's only one person, it's normal to doubt yourself. But if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a comedian where hundreds and thousands of other people do the same thing, what right do you have to tell yourself that you can't do it? So that's reverse egotism to think that you can't do something that so many other people can do. So I finally went up on stage and I found out that people thought I was funny. And it was very validating. I want to talk about your joke writing process a little bit. You said you just like to write things that strike you as funny, but are you, are, do you have a notebook with you? Are you recording stuff? How are you kind of keeping track of jokes you want to write? And, and what is your process? I think of things all the time. I'm always thinking of stuff. I keep a little notebook with me or I'll record it into my phone on the rare occasion when I don't have a notebook. I've even gotten out of bed to write down something at night because you tell yourself that you'll remember it, but you won't. If you get a funny thought at night, you have to get out of bed and write it down because by the morning, it's like a dream. It'll be gone. I have the ability to write jokes whenever I need them. When I used to write for people and they would give me a topic, I would just go home and immediately start writing. I guess it's like a songwriter. It's a gift that you're given that you can just come up with songs. I can just come up with jokes. It's easy for me. 
And I still have things that I want to do. But my process, you asked about my process. When I want to learn my material, I work with a recorder, a little audio recorder, and I repeat it into my recorder. I read it off the paper the way it should be perfectly. And then I keep playing it over and over to myself. The same way when you were a kid and you heard a song that you liked, you play it a million times, and before you know it, you'd know all the words. So that's what I do. I rehearse that way. Lately, I don't need to rehearse anymore. I've performed in so many shows, just hundreds and hundreds of shows. I write a set list. I go on stage with a set list, whether I look at it or not. And I bring my little recorder on stage with me and I record all my set. Before I'm going to perform, I play them back so I can hear myself doing the material. And that's basically it, you know? And I just love comedy so much. It's such a great thing, as you know, to be able to make people laugh. Yeah, it is great. Okay, I just have a few more questions here. This is actually, I'm just really curious about this, but I think some of our listeners who are professionals who are doing comedy might be interested. So I, I recently got some advice from a comedian who I really respect. But he said, don't tell people you're a veterinarian on stage because they won't think you're serious about comedy. He was telling me that with the best of intentions, but I just wanted to know your opinion about that because you kind of have had your feet a little bit in both worlds. Do you think that people trying to make it in comedy who have another profession, whether that's lawyer, accountant, but you're still working as that profession, should you say that on stage or should you just be like, no, I'm a professional comedian and this is what I do? Yeah, I would never say it on stage. It's one of the reasons I never told people. I wanted people to take me seriously. As soon as they know you have another career, it just bothered me. I'm like, I don't want to be known as the funny dentist. Billy Crystal said he remembered me that way because Jack Rollins, who managed Woody Allen and Billy Crystal and Robin Williams, he wanted to do a sitcom based on my story about a dentist who wanted to be in show business. And he wanted Billy Crystal to play me. And that's how I met Billy. I never talked about dentistry on stage. It's not funny to me. It's just, it's another thing that I do. And anything that could take away from your persona. When you're not 20 years old, people assume you do something else, <laughs> but they don't need to know. All right. It's not pertinent. So that's just my advice. I would never do that unless you're in a show called Funny Veterinarians. Right. In New York, they have Funniest Lawyer, Funniest Doctor. Once in a while, they have competitions. If you wanted to do that, that's a different story. But just in general, it's none of their business that you do this. No, that's great. Well, you have a lot of experience, so I, I really value your opinion. All right. We have hopped around a lot, but I, I, as I told you before we started, I was like, I felt like I was reading your bio is like studying for an exam because <laughs> you have so much that you've done. But is there anything else that you'd like to tell people about or anything that I forgot to ask you about or anything you'd want to promote? We'll put everything in our show notes as well. Yeah, just that my books are available on Amazon. I spend most of my time promoting my happiness books. Those are the ones that are the most important to me. I just got asked to be a, a keynote speaker at a very big convention coming up next year. And I'm talking about happiness and mindset and changing negative thinking to positive thinking. So if you're able to put up the links. Yeah, we'll definitely put them up for sure. And for people who like absurd humor, I would put up the link to Man Rob's Bank with His Chin. All right. To me, that's my favorite book in, in terms of a comedy. It's so silly. There's even a story of a dentist accidentally extracts man's face. <laughs> a lot of unusual stories. But I think we covered so much. We have one last question that I ask all of my guests. And I'm laughing because I think you might actually know him. But I would love to have Ken Jeong, who a, was a physician. He doesn't practice anymore. He's now a pretty famous comedian and actor. I would love to have him on this podcast. So the last question on the podcast is always to have my guests invite Ken Jung to come on co-medicine. Yeah, he's great. We did a, a video together. I don't think I have his contact information, but we met in Montreal for the last 30 years. I cover the Montreal Comedy Festival. It's the biggest comedy festival in the world. And I get to do the red carpet with all the big stars and shoot interviews on the red carpet. And Ken Jung showed up and I was so excited to meet him. And he said he was excited to meet me, too, because there's very few doctors who have a long standing career in comedy. Absolutely. So we took pictures together. I'll send you. I would love that. He's wonderful, though. He's a great guy. Very humble. Very nice because he's a doctor. He's not all about ego. It's very important to create a balance. Jackie Mason once told me he was a very dear friend. And I, I, I wrote a movie for Jackie Mason. He said, when you go in to buy a shirt, the guy just gives you the shirt. He doesn't give you the shirt and a picture of himself. But in show business, 
you're always telling people who you are and what you do. So there's so much ego involved and ego can be very damaging. So you have to create the balance and, you know, humility is very, very important. So everything is a gift. All this stuff is a gift. And when people ask me how I did it, I don't even have an answer. I don't know. I don't know how I met all these people. It just happened. I'm in the right place at the right time. And uh, it just happened. That's, <laughs> that's the only answer that I have. I'm glad you're spreading happiness. You're making me happy and you're making me think about a lot of different things. So it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I'm so glad I got to meet you. I'm kind of glad I didn't know how famous you were <laughs> before I asked you because <laughs> I would have been intimidated, but uh, you've been so gracious uh, and I appreciate you spending the time. So thank you so much for being on Co-Medicine. You're very kind, Sarah, and I appreciate you asking me to be on. It's always an honor when someone wants to know about you. So thank you very much. And that wraps up another episode of Co-Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Mark Edwards, uh, who wrote the music for this podcast. He is a very funny comedian, also a musician who writes music that makes me laugh. I don't know. Is that a thing? I don't know. He can do that. Also want to shout out to Heather McPherson of Twisted Spur Media, who's our producer and editor uh, who makes everything work. I could not do this podcast without her. And I want to thank you for listening and for sticking with us in season two. Uh, if you're new to co-medicine, welcome. Uh, if you've been listening since the beginning, welcome back. Uh, it's great to have you here. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please uh, share and like and give us a review. If you didn't like it, I don't know what you're still doing here. If you didn't like this podcast, you could do nothing. Nothing would be good. <laughs>